I'm Jeff Fritz with Soundstage.com, and I'm joined today by Garrett Hongo. Garrett is a contributor to uh, Soundstage Ultra. He has been since 2007. Uh, back then, it was Ultra Audio, but Garrett has been with Soundstage for going on a decade and a half, and that's, uh, gosh, that just seems like a long time. But Garrett, how are you today, buddy? I'm good. I'm happy to talk with you, Jeff. Well, I appreciate you being here, and we're not just chatting just to chat. Uh, you have a big uh, date coming up here in the not too distant future, and that is the debut of your book, uh, "The Perfect Sound: A Memoir in Stereo." And uh, you know, at, at Soundstage, we're excited about this, and just wanted to chat a little bit with you about it. So, tell us what made you decide to write a book, Garrett. Well, you know, I, I had this sideline career as a writer uh, for literary purposes, and. Uh, I was in Hawaii dreaming about buying a tube amplifier to improve my system. And then I thought, why don't I just propose this as a book to my agent? And so I can go ahead and buy this, get an advance and buy this tube amplifier. <laughs> she loved the idea. And about 10 days later, I had the money in my bank account and um, started taking notes for writing this book. I got the amplifier and it was my reference for a few years. I moved on from it, but it gave me a lot of pleasure and taught me a lot about sound and listening for different things in audio. Um, so it's been a kind of odyssey about of exploration about how I can get my system to deliver the kind of sound I want from the music I want, the recording recorded music I want. And it's been a big adventure. Now, what year did you start writing the book? You mentioned uh, buying the tube amplifier and that it's not your reference. So I would assume that this has this 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 book has been a journey that's taken you a little while. You know, it, it took a long time to figure out how to write it, but I really didn't start writing it about two until 2015 or so. Um, most of it was just noodling around, keeping a journal, taking notes, trying to, you know, not sound foolish in many ways, but also learning a lot about the history of audio, you know, how it got started um, in electronics. In fact, how it got started in acoustic amplification as well. You know, the Greek amphitheater and megaphone and uh, soundboards and lyres and guitars. I just sort of went, went, went dope, made a deep dive into the history of um, amplification, you know. Meanwhile, I, I expanded my appreciation for all kinds of music. I started by wanting to have a system that could play back recordings of opera, which I fell in love with um, after I visited Europe and Italy and La Scala when I saw it such a, in such an intimate setting. And the music was so startling and moving. Uh, you know, in America, we sit so far away from the stage, like a baseball field away. But in Europe, you know, the, the, the houses are very intimate and it's almost as though the orchestra and singers are in your lap. It's a completely different experience. And I wanted to be able to reproduce it with a stereo system. And it took me a long time to figure out how to get that done, you know. And when I did, um, I think the two big revelations for me to tell you the truth, were Sonus Faber ample, uh, uh, Sonus Faber speakers, you know, the Italian, and uh, tube amps. They, they seemed to give me what I wanted, and then I started exploring all the music of my past, you know, rock and roll and jazz and even cheesy pop, and I just fell into it, you know. Well, you know, it's interesting that you, um, you know, I know in your book, I have not read the book yet, but I have read excerpts from your book. And in fact, I'll just go ahead and plug uh, soundstageglobal.com. Probably by the time this video appears on YouTube, we will have uh, an entire er excerpt from Garrett's book. And it's all about the mini flex speaker. And there's some history in there about Edgar Vilcher and the acoustic suspension loudspeaker and the history of that. And, you know, I had I actually wrote uh, last year uh, an opinion piece for Soundstage Ultra on that very subject. So I was super interested in the way that you wrote about that, Garrett, and covered that. And, uh, and we're actually going to publish that excerpt 
on Soundstage Global. But tell me a little bit about just your research because you you go back and there's there's it's it's a journey from what I can gather. It's your journey, but then there is a great historical element in the book that if if someone wants to learn really about the history of hi-fi and some of the most important moments uh th they're in there and tell us a little bit about how you went about researching those those topics and and what interests you most about those things well that history is one of the three narratives that are in the book you know the first narrative is about my falling into hi-fi and in sort of late middle age and wanting to produce my systems and the second narrative is about being involved with music since I was a kid in Hawaii, you know, on the edge of the sugarcane fields and the ocean. The third narrative is the history of audio, as you say. Um, I went about by just reading um, haphazardly or casually or with interest, like any other hobbyist might. I, I, I'd, I'd look around and find articles online about different uh, inventors and different engineers and started pursuing and I started focusing on the, the things that I was most interested in. One of them was about my father's equipment when he was building his stereo systems. He built it from a Heath kit and then a Dyna kit and then he designed his own integrated amplifier and bought speakers um, from a discount house in LA and the speaker he bought was a universal mini flex speaker which was a kind of compact version of Edgar Vilcher's AR speaker, which he invented in uh, the late 50s, uh, started producing in the 60s. And how I, I found the story in various strange and wonderful old audio magazines, you know, and different friends of mine would start giving me these things that they just found in their garage or their parents had or they happened to have. And, I started reading around and, uh, you know, then I found some books, uh, from tinfoil to stereo was a major book. It's a book on the invention of the phonograph. Um, and there are many, many others, um, uh, some of them like the RCA radio handbook, you know, I started reading that stuff. And, and then a friend of mine gave me these old catalogs from, um, the fifties, uh, probably how my father found them, you know. I won't say that it was a concerted scholarly or academic effort. It was a hobbyist effort out of devotion and curiosity. And I just followed it. Um, well, well, you know, what? well, I was going to say what's interesting about reading the excerpt and it, 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 it struck me just the way that you described the Miniflex speaker you know, some of the things that we write about and you being an audio journalist, I'm an audio journalist, the way we write about these products today and the technologies, some of the engineering uh, aspects of the products, you know, we write about them like they're fairly recent developments or, or fairly new. And when you read, um, you know, that excerpt about the Miniflex, you really realize that most of these things or at least quite a few of the challenges for good audio and in that case the, the the loudspeaker these were things that were tackled and to a large degree accomplished decades and decades ago by these you know these pioneers these true geniuses and i i just find it interesting how today we write about products like some of these things are brand new when in fact they've been around for 30 40 50 years did, did you find that yourself well, I love the story of American invention and American devotion and genius, applying different kinds of um, problem, attacking different kinds of problems. Vilcher himself was not in the mainstream of the hi-fi industry. You know, he was a, a tinkerer, a hobbyist, but he came up with the revolutionary idea to create a sort of air spring uh, driver as opposed to a... Uh, a mechanical uh, driver to create the kind of linearity that we're so familiar with today. You know, a bit before Edgar Vilcher, things were on springs and they, the distortion was so high, you know, and speakers had to be huge, these old Western electric things 
and the Altec Lansings, which could sound wonderful, but who could have them in their home unless you were very wealthy and had a very large house and a large living room? What Vilcher was able to do was to create the airspring speaker um, um, and use uh, the compression of, of the, uh, inside a vacuum in order to, to, uh, to absorb the energy, the back energy or the back uh, 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 reaction of the speaker so that uh, you could have a much more compact speaker. And then people like my father, people who were lower middle class, GIs coming back from Korea and World War II, could create a surrogate system in their home. It was revolutionary. And it brought hi-fi, the pleasure of music, to a wide variety of people all over the world. And he was rejected, Vilcher was. He took the, his idea to, to major manufacturers. Um, I won't mention them, but they all just said, well, if you know, this work, we would already know about it. And they turned him away. <laughs> so he created his own company to make this, these speakers with a guy who was making cabinets in Boston. Um, and well, lo and behold, it revolutionized everything. And it really created hi-fi, you know, along with the invention of the microgroove LP and the full frequency range uh, uh, recordings that we have since since then as well. It's a it's a story of like humanity's use of technology to create pleasure, and that's what's fascinating for me. Well, and it's interesting to me the way that you weave the historical elements of the hi-fi industry into your own personal journey, or I should say your own personal journey is kind of weaved into the book sort of through some of these uh, some of these historical elements, some of these things that you describe. My next question, Garrett, and, and this, you know, you, you mentioned um, or we mentioned at the beginning that you've been writing for Soundstage uh, for, uh, I guess, 14 years now. Where do you feel like you are in your audio journey today? And do you feel like with the publication of this book that you've reached kind of a culminating point? Or do you feel like you're still on the journey as we speak? Well, it is a kind of culminating point, uh, not just the book, but my new listening room and new equipment. Um, I changed to much larger room that I used to have. At that time, that my, my room was perfect, but then this larger room needed a different kind of speaker, and I had to search for that. And the, I tell the story in the book about essentially searching the world for the speaker. You were one of the first actually to review that speaker for Soundstage back when. And uh, it's especially good for the kind of music I love to listen to. In terms of the point here, it's a point of more pleasure and enjoyment than sort of obsession. In, in, in the beginning days of the hobby for me, it was almost fanatical. Uh, and I guess you might say um, unstable and uh, erratic because I was getting frustrated so much and I knew so little. And the advices I was given were piecemeal or uh, irrelevant or only partial. And I couldn't put the whole thing together um in my mind now i think i have a a sense of what the field is in terms of equipment available but pretty much what i how i like to listen the other thing i want to incorporate is a product that can open me up or change my mind about things and you know every once in a while products like that do come along you know we've had this amazing explosion of development in digital technology for music right now and that's a very fast changing area and it's something that I uh, sort of pay attention to and I know that you and Doug are very very informed about this field so I, I allow myself to be tutored by betters as it were like like the articles that you write and that Doug writes about all the new products in, in the digital field my own pursuit is looking at analog you know, turntables and cartridges, even phono stages, and using that as my main medium. And uh, I recently discovered a, a new turntable and tone arm 
manufactured in England by Helios that uh, in some ways revolutionized my, my listening uh, and my, my ability to, to hear more music from what's recorded. I reviewed it for Soundstage Ultra recently. So you, you, you have, I guess I would say, I enjoy my system and the way I listen, but I'm also careful not to become too self-satisfied, to allow to be, myself to be tutored. And, and you have to keep an open mind, you know, and, and that's something that uh, uh, is essential, I think, to, 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 to receiving, um, in some ways, the wealth of all the effort of humankind to create the experiences that we're able to, you know. There's going to be an El Edgar Vilcher. Uh, every so often, you have to be receptive. No, that's, that's, that's a very good point and a very good perspective. Well, uh, you mentioned your system and, you know, at the beginning of the conversation, you talked about Sonus Faber speakers and, you know, I, I don't know if you're aware, but right now I actually have Sonus Faber speakers as my reference. I have a pair of Maxima Amateurs that I absolutely love here now. I although... know. It's just so interesting. You've gone from the huge magical cues and the rock ports to a two-way from Sonus Faber. Well, you know, you, you may see in the background that I do have a pair of Vivid Gias here, uh, G1 Spirits, and, and those specifically are here for me to write about and then also to review a, a, a Griffin Audio Designs amplifier that needed something a little bigger than the Sonus Fobbers. But I absolutely love the Sonus Fobbers. And so that's interesting that that's kind of where you, you, you started and that's where I'm at. But my question for you, Garrett, my next question, you mentioned a pair of speakers, and I, I know what they are, but you didn't mention the name that you have right now. Tell us a little bit about your current system. You know, this if the book is a culminating point, I think most people would want to know, well, where are you in your hi-fi journey in terms of your system beyond just the Helios turntable that you mentioned? Well, the speakers that I found... Um, I, and I, I literally searched the world for them because not many were imported to America. They're manufactured by a German company called Ascendo. I think they, they, they prefer you to pronounce it. I, I simply call them Ascendos because that's the way they're spelled. My model is the M uh, or MS, which is the largest speaker they make. And it's uh, a large three-way with a ribbon tweeter, an eight-inch mid-range, and a 10 inch woofer that's embedded within the cabinet. And it rocks the house. I mean, and its refinement is superb. Uh, I, I think I, I have to say, I really love ribbon tweeters for what they can do for the human voice in opera and brass in jazz and even orchestral music, orchestral brass. There's a there's a quality that they can achieve that um, to me is the best. I, I really like the ribbon tweeter. Um, the eight inch mid range is especially important for me because of the size of the room. I mean, it's not a huge room. It's about 14 by 30 or so, but I do need a large mid range and it satisfies uh, that requirement, particularly for, for instruments like the violin viola um jazz guitar it just sounds great my electronics are largely uh, made by zandon in japan i have a zandon phono stage a preamp and uh uh one uh a kt 122 amplifier i i really love them i i reviewed three of those two of those pieces for ultra audio but I also have a Heron phono stage that's a tube phono stage. The Xanon is a solid state. I also have a Pass Lab solid state. I mean, I'm, I'm nuts in the hobby. Um, I have a, two analog sources. I have a TW acoustic uh, AC1 turntable in my main system. And on the side, I have the Helios tone arm and uh, turntable. Um, and I, I think I, I can say I, I really love Japanese cart, phono cartridges. I have um, Zix uh, Ultimate 4D on the Helios, and I have a, uh, well, it's not Japanese, is it? It's called Kiseki. 
and it's made in uh, the Netherlands, I believe. And it's sort of a, back in the day, it was the imitation koetsu. I, I find it wonderful. And I have a Miyajima mono cartridge. I have two arms on the Raven AC. The um, um, cables I use are a combination of audience um, and the latest that they make and and also zandon that zandon makes i use a zandon um, xlr uh interconnect between the preamp and the and the amplifier and and i i use a, a kind of a complex um jumper system with the speakers made by synergistic which is a uh, you know it, it's all about the sound and i've been tinkering and i do the things that we audiophiles do, mix and match. But I try to tend to listen to the advice of manufacturers about what might optimize their equipment best. And so I do tend to match amps and preamps by the same manufacturer and cabling by the same man manufacturer. Like I say, most of my cabling is by audience power interconnects and um, digital cables. So that's worked out pretty well. Well, it's funny that you mentioned the Eskendo speakers because I wanted just to, to chat with you for a second about those. I remember hearing those in Germany when uh, Soundstage first started attending high end. And I'm not sure if that was back in the Frankfurt days or it was right when the show moved to Munich. But I would hear those speakers, you know, in very large rooms in Germany. And one thing that did stand out is those speakers could really drive a room. They could pressurize a room. They were very dynamic. They did not compress easily. They did not distort easily. They, they really could do the, the subtle things, but they could rock too. And so it, 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 when you said that your room is 14 by 30 and that you, you needed a speaker that could really fill that room with the type of sound that you're looking for, it did not surprise me when you mentioned uh, the Eskendo speakers, and I, I, I haven't, I haven't seen him or talked to him in a long time. But I remember, I think the designer's name is Jurgen Shearing, if I'm not mistaken, and he was a very, very passionate, uh, uh, dedicated, uh, really talented designer, loudspeaker designer, and uh, we'll have to find out if he's if he's still around with the company. But yeah, those those are those are really good speakers that you have. Well, I love them. I'm, I had the Z's, which is a sort of um, smaller version, you know, um, with a smaller cabinet, um, same tweeter. Uh, and I heard those at my first CES in 2008, I believe, in Las Vegas. And um, there was an importer who, 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 who had a show in the uh, uh, convention hall. And he had air, uh, an air... Uh, universal player and uh, cat amplification and preamp, you know, convergent audio technology. And it's still a sound that stayed with me. So when I first started looking for a different speaker, I tried the, the Z's, which is a smaller version. And it just didn't pressurize the room, as you say, but it sounded so good. But, uh, and then I found the amps and I moved up to them. Uh, you know, they, it took a truck to bring them, you know. <laughs> I was even looking to buy a pair that was in Turkey, in Istanbul. Wow. You know, I found a pair in, in Mumbai, in India, and, and in Brooklyn. And in each case, there were logistical challenges, you know. And luckily, I ended up finding one a pair in Portland. And they came down to me, delivered in a Pepperidge Farm liftgate truck. Wow, what we do for the hobby. Well, Garrett, listen, uh, we all look forward to The Perfect Sound, a memoir in stereo coming out. Can you give us just a little information about uh, how they can pre-order the book, uh, where it's going to be available, and the release date? Well, the release date is February 22nd. Um, that's the official one. Uh, I know copies are in the warehouse now. I just got my first box of books a few days ago. Uh, you can pre-order from any of many sites, Amazon, uh, Barnes & Noble, uh, booksellers. Um, the publisher, can your, your local bookstore can order them uh, and directly from uh, Penguin Random House. The publisher is Pantheon Books. 
which is a division of Penguin Random House. And I'm very happy to be there. Um, uh, so so uh, just go to any of those sites or look at my website, GarrettHongo.com. It's my name uh, without any interruption, uh, GarrettHongo.com. And you can click on books and then there's a whole menu that pops up about where you might prefer to order your, your copy. And they're all available for pre-order now. Well, that's terrific. I look forward to reading the book. And then I also look forward, Garrett, to having uh, your writing continue on Soundstage Ultra. And who knows what the what the journey is going to, you know, where the journey is going to take both of us for the next for the next few years. But I look forward to it. And I really appreciate you joining me today and telling us about your uh, about your book. And we all look forward to it. Well, thank you so much, Jeff. It's been lovely working with you through these years and seeing your changes as well and evolution someday i really want to talk to you about that <laughs> well that's that could be the subject of another youtube uh soundstage talks interview maybe but uh all right garrett we'll talk to you soon have a great day you too